All right, hi everyone. Welcome to this Heidelberg AI event. Uh, great to see everyone back in person. We only had one other uh, in-person event this year with Simon from DeepMind. Um, so yeah, it, it's great to be back. And we also have our drinks and snack bar uh, up again. Drinks, you can already take one if you want, beer, water, or uh, spritzer for now. And then the, the snacks are for later, for after the talk, for like socializing part. Um, all right, so today we have uh, Jonas, Konstantin, and Robert here from Aleph Alpha. And um, yeah, so, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about Jonas uh, <laughs> because I, I found his CV online. And um, so he studied at KIT, um, at industrial engineering, and then came to Heidelberg founded one startup, AI startup here already a few years ago, then went to work for Apple, and now he founded his most recent startup, Aleph Alpha. Um, and the, the mission of Aleph Alpha, when you read it online, is something like build transformative AI to, revolution, to, to bring the next industrial revolution or something. Very ambitious, and I have to say it's super refreshing to hear such ambitious statements from a German AI startup, because I think there are not so many, especially in context of the big players from overseas. So we are already cheering for you. Uh, and they're not even, not only from Germany, but from Heidelberg. So kind of uh, our local uh, heroes here uh, in the big uh, corporate game. And so, yeah, um, but the other thing is when you try to find out what they're exactly doing on a technical level, it's very hard, like uh, the, the, the slogans are ambitious, but also kind of secretive when you're trying to find out what's really going on. So that's why we're very excited to have them here today uh, to tell us uh, what they're doing. Um, yeah, so let's give a warm applause to Jonas, Konstantin and Robert. Awesome, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. I think I was, last time I was here, it was when the invertible networks were presented. Right? So it's quite quite a while ago. Um, yeah, thanks for the warm introduction. Um, I'll, I'll kind of have the shortest part of our presentation that will introduce, like show you a, a little bit about the company and then uh, that my two colleagues will go more in depth with our research and what we're currently working on. Um, so just to set the scene, right? So this is the, the era I, come, I came from where you had infrastructure code, you had logic code, you had kind of small models. Those models could be anything from like random forests or complex nested if then else statements. And everybody was building their own, right? So when you have like these uh, lanes, which are kind of product solutions, and everybody was kind of building their own, there were some components that were reused, but it was basically all just like a big puzzle pieces uh, of, of heterogeneous solutions. So this was the pre-cloud era. And then um, this is the time we are in right now, where um, something has changed in the infrastructure layer. The infrastructure layer is now owned by the hyperscalers, the big cloud providers. They dominate that game. And um, they not only concentrate the market in terms of like, like dominance, they also um, have uh, make accessible a level of, of technology that was unheard of. Uh, things you can get with, with services like, like Lambda are, are things that you, you would have had dozens of people work on for years, right? To, to, to achieve something similar, right? So it's, it's a dominance, it's a concentration of, of power, and they're earning a lot of money. When you look at the, the margin, uh, it's uh, ridiculous. Uh, but it also provides a level of technology and a level of fidelity that's easy to use, scalable, that um, was, it was impossible before. So, and uh, we believe that basically the same thing is currently happening with intelligence. Um, so there is, um, in, in today's world, um, a lot of solutions are on a very individual level. They are kind of, uh, somebody collects data and, and labels the data and then trains a network or kind of comes up with a, with a feature engineering um, solution. And what we're seeing right now is a concentration. There is, uh, there is big services, generalizable services that make accessible a level of functionality and fidelity that um, is unheard of. And I myself would have assumed to be impossible just a few years ago. And we'll see some cool examples um, on that. 
yeah, and this is the game we are we are playing. So this is from uh, Rise of AI. Uh, Hans basically giving an overview over uh, large pre-trained models. And of course, if you're familiar with with the technology, you know that basically ranking them according to a parameter count is highly questionable, right? Because it, there's a lot more to these models than pure parameter count. But I think the takeaway here is that um, size plays a big role. There, this is a game that is. Uh, has a lot of focus. There's a lot of kind of traction going on there. There's a lot of uh, commercial, but also uh, academic traction. And we are on that list, right? I mean, that that's why I basically use that uh, that slide, uh, basically showing that, yeah, there, there's kind of all the usual suspects um, uh, going on there. And we are on that list. And this is saying 200 billion parameters. And yeah, we now have a 300 billion parameter model in training. Um, so, yeah, I think we are somewhat competing on a similar level. Um, we have trained our model in five languages, and we can always, we'll see some examples on, on that uh, later. And another thing we did is we built our own data center. And what that means is we, it's not just co-locating. It's not just that we kind of rented some racks or we kind of rented some instances. We actually control the building so we can kick everybody, any, anybody out if they kind of misbehave. And um, we have, have built this as the the biggest European commercial cluster. I'm saying commercial because, of course, those kind of Jülich and, and, and right, all these others are bigger. Uh, this is 512 A100, 80 gigabytes with InfiniBand fabric. And we have about the same capacity um, in the cloud as well. Um, the reason is that uh, if you want to be sovereign, if you want to control technology, then of course this needs to include also access to hardware. We're currently uh, in conversations with some of our academic partners on maybe kind of to join forces there uh, on operating, making accessible that level of technology because this is something that, that we care about a lot um, that we have still, we, and this was also part of Hans' talk, right? So uh, you, you can look it up, it's a great presentation there. Europe is phenomenal in research. We have brilliant researchers. When you look at the papers, when you look at who invented deep learning, so to speak, right? Not to play into that meme too much, but um, those are a lot of European names come up. We have brilliant researchers. We have brilliant professors, brilliant PhDs. But one of the um, one of the challenges of this era is that um, you need more than a brilliant mind. You need access to a lot of compute. You need that now how to operate to run that. Um, compute and how to optimize your algorithms and your models on these clusters. And I think this is a danger where if we don't solve that for our research um, um, community, right, we are risking kind of being left behind. Because all your great ideas are basically useless if you can really make them fly. And this unfortunately comes with seven-figure price tags in some instances. Right. And, and the times when, when, when I started the last company, that was kind of basically shortly after ImageNet, when the computer vision revolution was kicking up. And by then, every PhD student could kind of buy a desktop PC, two GPUs, and could basically run their experiments. And those times are over. Um, in terms of industrial revolution, I, I like to use that, that phrase. And of course, we can debate about it over beers later. Um, but when you look at the output per hour worked and the GDP per capita, I think these are kind of two interesting perspectives. And when you look at the right-hand side, um, it seems unlikely that this will just, it's just a calm development that will continue as is. But this is kind of wild. And um, whatever the future brings, I think it's reasonable to assume that, that it's not going to be business as usual for the next 50 years. Um, there, are some, there are some estimations on transformative AI. I like to also like to use the term transformative AI because it's a little bit less contagious than AGI. I'm um, also happy to debate about that. Um, that we, with all likelihood, within the next 10 years, will be able to build transformative AI. And transformative AI could then revolutionize and, and transform about 50% or more of what we today call work. And this is, of course, a big like, challenge, right? This is our, our challenge as researchers is to help humanity 
into that new era in the best possible way. And we're not going to, we, we techies are not going to solve it alone, but we can, we can contribute to that. We can contribute by building great systems, communicating about them openly, and including everybody in, in that discussion, and uh, yeah, giving our best to try and figure out what to do. Um, and of course, one of the big parts of that means having the skill of building those systems. And that's why we are in, in Germany, we're in Heidelberg, and why we're building those systems. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about world models. Um, so if you are as old as me, then that maybe kind of looks familiar. That is uh, Doom, or kind of the Doom engine, the Doom environment. And this was a paper, I think 2016, um, that um, used the kind of virtual, virtual world of Doom to build a world model. And in the middle, you see the vector representation, the, the embedding of this world model. And so if you play around with the dimensions of these, of these embedding, uh, embedding vectors, then you see the reproduction changes. So this was a, a world model uh, has, that has learned somewhat to understand the world of Doom and, and navigated. And this was shortly after. Um, and a, a similar world model uh, is a racer uh, driving around. And this, the special thing about, about that world model is this agent is only really seeing the world whenever there's a red um, kind of border. Right? So it's not, it doesn't have constant vision, but it's using is its pre-learned world understanding and world model to safely navigate, safely-ish, right? It's not perfect, to n navigate that, that course. All right, so these are world models. Uh, they, they've been introduced, they've been used to help agents navigate an environment, uh, understand the situation they're in, uh, basically solve perception and planning. And now what we are, what we are basically doing with, with these language models and multimodal models is something pretty similar in, in that we are having a sequence of tokens of words, and we're using this model to just uh, run prediction on possible next tokens. Um, and if you think about it, that's somewhat similar to these world models. We have an observation, we have a context, and then we are running prediction, um, prediction as on, on that. And the interesting thing here is that the world of language, the world of all possible language, uh, implicitly contains a lot of things that matter to us humans, because that was what we invented language for. We invented language to be able to communicate and think about and persist all kinds of knowledge that's important to us. Uh, right, so, so language is much more than grammar, is much more than, than patterns, speech patterns. It's actually pretty much everything that matters to us. Um, and so if you, uh, this is kind of a little bit a, a step into neuroscience, and I'm not the expert here, but I found this quote to be particularly inspiring. Uh, and what, what, what's here is that the brain is much more than a perception, it's a prediction machine. And it's using prior knowledge of the world to make inferences and hypotheses about the cause of sensory information. I think that's super interesting. And when you, when you start reading into that, you'll, you'll learn that uh, a lot of how we perceive ourselves in the world is basically a model we have learned and built. And that's only vaguely inspired by actually some sensory input. So that maybe kind of shows us that uh, what we're building here with these models is not terribly different from parts of what's happening in human brains. And just to be clear, human brains are doing more than that. Right? So this is not like a 100% a reproduction of what's happening inside a human brain. But I think there are some similarities here. Um, so basically, these, um, these, these models can do a lot more than just understanding grammar and understanding speech. So I was trying to outsource my, my job to, to our model. Uh, this is a uh, Luminous Supreme model. I'm basically describing the situation we are in. The field of AI is progressing at an incredible rate as a small startup that operates with significantly more constraints, but has assembled a team that operates on a world-class level. What are, what are my options? Right? So I'm getting some suggestions here from Luminous. Um, I should hire some top talent from one of these organizations as consultants or even employees. Um, right? And so this will give them some time away um, while they can kind of join us to get things done quickly. Right? So yeah, and, and which might lead down other paths later if it goes well. Right? So that, I think, pretty, pretty sound advice, pretty good advice. 
Um, and now I'm asking how to do that. So basically, I'm just uh, attaching this um, completion and add to do these, follow these steps. And then I'll get kind of find out how, where have people worked um, by linked, looking at LinkedIn. If no luck, try uh, contacting those individuals via email. Right? So that's pretty, pretty sound. That's pretty decent uh, advice. And uh, you could basically more or less directly execute that. And um, what I'm showing you that is to, to basically show that um, a lot of the stuff we're doing um, where we are thinking so highly of our logic capacity, of our, our analytical skills, of our, of our intelligence, um, a lot of those things are not unlike the completions we're getting from these models. So I think that's very interesting. It's a very interesting um, conversation to have um, how much reasoning and logic and planning is kind of already implicit in this language modeling task. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, trying to uh, delegate to, to uh, so and I think the, the time, and this was kind of one of the, the cool, exciting, exciting developments as well, right? I remember uh, 10 years ago, there was this assumption that the job that will be, the, the, the first jobs that will be lost are these kind of manual jobs. Right, the, the bricklayer, the, the cleaning per, the personnel, right? And now it looks to be actually the opposite. It looks like the artist is the first job that's maybe in danger, or the the CEO, right? I mean, that's that's exciting. Um, yeah, and some some of the things we're building, and just like some example to give you an idea of what we're actually doing from a commercial perspective. Um, so this is a Lumi. Lumi is a conversational agent, and uh, a conversational agent is much more than just a. Uh, world model. So basically, you, and if you want to trans transform a language model, a world model, to a conversational agent, you have to give it like a goal and some intentions, and uh, yeah, and, and this is that. Uh, on the left hand side, I'm a little, um, we're a little bit cheeky, uh, and on the right hand side, this is something we we built with the city of Heidelberg, where we are making all the information that the city of Heidelberg wants to make accessible to its citizens. We are kind of making this accessible via Lumi, via this conversational agent. And when you have, if you have any experience talking to Siri or Alexa, then you know that this is a level of fidelity that uh, the, these assistants don't offer. And of course, this is not because AWS or, or Apple is not capable of doing that, but it's basically because they're scared. Because with that level of freedom, with that level of capability, also comes a certain level of danger in terms of you can, if you give this, AI so much freedom, you can never be 100% sure that it's not going to say the wrong thing. Right? Because if everything is possible, then you can't really kind of write a list of kind of blacklist of things that it shouldn't say. So this is interesting. And of course, we also tried um, the famous Lambda prompt. Right? So this also shows that uh, Lumi has quite a bit of character, um, and we maybe can count on its, its loyalty. Yeah, um, and maybe just to, to round this up, uh, this is a world model. This has learned the, to, to, to approximate the distribution over all possible tokens in all the ways we are using language. And of course, if you want to solve intelligence, you need much more than just modeling distributions. You need to take action. And uh, you can do this. You can, like a world model can be extremely helpful there. So you can use the world model to understand the situation you're in possible actions and its co their consequences, and then plan for those. And this is another, this is kind of like an example of, of an instance where we did something like that. We used a world model. We planned all possible future states. We planned all, uh, all, all meaningful decisions and outcomes. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you want to take action, if you want to do more than just modeling distributions, you need something like that, or maybe another approach to solve the same problem. Um, yeah, and uh, we are also, of course, thinking about how to achieve more capability, like stronger capabilities. And um, we are not just buying more GPUs, although this is also what we're doing, right? But we don't think that uh, kind of basically the only research frontier left is just how to acquire more money for more GPUs. Yeah, and now look at some actual kind of technical details. Uh, Thanks, and I'll hand over to Constantine. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, maybe I'll just shortly introduce myself as well. Uh, my name is Konstantin Eichenberg. I'm a mathematician turned AI researcher. I uh, joined Aleph Alpha, Alpha last year. And uh, yeah, today I have uh, the pleasure of um, telling you about uh, our current milestones uh, towards world models. So um, I'm going to start with our luminous models, which are large-scale multilingual transformers made in Heidelberg, made by us, which are, of course, the backbone of our technology currently. So, uh, yeah, a little bit about the luminous architecture. Uh, luminous is a family of GPT-style transformers. In contrast, though, to GPT-3, for example, which was trained on a large uh, web corpus, mainly consisting of English, um, we um, explicitly uh, include more dedicated um, corp uh, text corpora of other languages as well, namely uh, German, French, Italian, and Spanish. So uh, yeah, our model has uh, much better multilingual capabilities than GPT-3, for example. Um, also just to, uh, I'm, I'm guessing most of you are aware of uh, G uh, what GPT style means, but Maybe for those who don't, I'll give a short recap. So a GPT-style transformer is a decoder-only autoregressive transformer, which does natural language modeling by next word or next token prediction. So just as a little refresher how that works, I'll start with a prompt. Here in the example, it would be once upon A. Then uh, I embed every uh, individual token through a word embedding layer, which is nothing more than a big lookup table. Um, mapping every token to a uh, dense embedding vector. And then these vectors uh, propagate through many, many decoder layers uh, through which um, self-attention is performed with a causal mask allowing information propagation only forward. And then the language uh, modeling head produces from, from these hidden states at the end uh, prop next token probability distribution from which uh, you can either uh, then obtain the training objective in form of cross-entropy loss, or you can sample the next token and repeat the process. And this is very effective and enables surprising capabilities such as future prompting and in-context learning that I'm sure uh, you all know about. Okay, so I already mentioned Luminous uh, GPT style, and uh, you know that uh, especially GPT-3, of course, it's a huge model, so the question imposes itself, uh, how large uh, are our luminous models? Okay, so at the moment we have three uh, luminous models in deployment, luminous base, luminous extended, and luminous supreme, with a parameter count ranging from 13 billion parameters to 70 billion parameters. And uh, of course, size is not all that matters, but what also might be very interesting is the total train compute measured in floating point operations to train the model. And um, as you can see, Luminous Supreme, we are at a proud uh, about three times 10 to the 23 floating point operations, which is already quite close to uh, the compute budget of uh, GPT-3. Okay, so yeah, you can see we spent a lot of resources to uh, train Luminous. So uh, how does it fare against the competition? For this, uh, we compared the performance of our biggest one, Luminous Supreme, uh, across several natural language uh, benchmarks against the competition from Big Science, uh, OPT, Jurassic, and GPT-3. And as you can see, our scores are very competitive, sometimes uh, even best. And keep in mind that we only have uh, less than half the parameters of, for example, GPT-3. Now, I already mentioned, in terms of total uh, compute budget, we are about the same. But also remember that because of um, the reduced parameters, our inference is much cheaper than, for example, GPT-3. And that's also something to consider. OK, so this would basically conclude the section on our backbone, uh, Luminous. There is also much to tell about actually training these models, which uh, is actually a huge challenge. But this would go more in the engineering direction and would probably uh, be worth its own talk. So today I'm going to focus more on the concept conceptual and uh, research side of things. OK, 
So as uh, Jonas uh, already announced, um, we also have uh, multimodal capabilities actually with Luminous, and now I'm gonna uh, tell you the, the framework behind this. Maybe first uh, a little bit of uh, background. So I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with a lot of these very popular image data sets like MNIST, Cypher, ImageNet. I mean, I, I personally started my deep learning career with a MLP tutorial trained on MNIST and I'm pretty sure uh, it's probably similar for many people here. Um, so these, these data sets are, are very popular and uh, have been used extensively to train uh, CNNs, later than and ResNets, and all that stuff. Um, but they have two major issues. So one of them is um, they have only a very limited number of classes, even ImageNet, which boasts a somewhat impressive number of thousand classes, it's kind of uh, pales still in comparison to the uh, crazy wild things we see in the real world, right? Uh, we cannot really hope to build a world model or achieve AGI, um, assuming that there are only a thousand different uh, kinds of objects, that's still really tiny. And the other problem is, of course, that these data sets, because they have to be manually annotated, they do not really scale. And um, we, we've seen that, uh, at least so far, with this large transformer model, they are very data hungry, and we cannot really uh, hope to get to that scale with um, hand annotated data. Okay, so that was uh, already kind of, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven, or even more years ago. And then a bit more recently, we have seen uh, an emergence of self-supervised uh, vision models, vision language models. Uh, I think uh, a very important uh, hallmark here was uh, CLIP. So um, CLIP was trained on a massive amount of uh, web crawled image text pairs. And just to give you also a short reminder what CLIP does, so CLIP has two encoder models, a text encoder and an image encoder and it's then simply trained uh, self-supervised on a contrastive loss. So what CLIP can do is you can give it a text and an image and it uh, produces some kind of uh, cosine similarity for you, uh, which you can then use to uh, do, zero, for example, zero-shot classification. And um, yeah, CLIP is much more flexible um, because of that. Then uh, later on, there were also, uh, I'm just gonna briefly mention that there were also um, models built around transformer encoder architectures uh, multimodal models like OSCAR, which, does, as you can see, does some kind of um, multimodal cross embedding and then some bird like mass token loss together with a contrastive loss. Uh, it's kind of a fancy training objective. And um, OSCAR is very, uh, can be adapted to various uh, more sophisticated uh, vision language tasks, such as um, visual question answering or um, image captioning, but uh, just like BERT, it always kind of has to be fine-tuned on every task, and it's not uh, really generative uh, in a way. So um, what we thought is, well, we have um, already some very nice uh, large language models, which are great at uh, generating outputs when prompted, and we kind of want to extend their capabilities and make them able to also understand uh, images and text, or uh, yeah, any combination of image and text, really. Um, so before we dive into the uh, method here, I'm just going to present to you some examples right away of what uh, such a um, model which is uh, augmented in that way can do. So um, on the left, for example, you have a co very common use case, visual question answering. And these examples, um, the image and the black text are the input to the model and the green text is the output of the model. And uh, as you can see, it, it can do uh, all kinds of things. On the right here, we have uh, OCR, but also combined with uh, like completion. And yeah, my favorite is actually in the middle because there you have these infamous typographical uh, attacks where some models like CLIP also uh, fail. So uh, for example, a CLIP would give um, the rightmost image, the, the apple with the iPod label would give a very high uh, similarity to uh, the text iPod. Uh, whereas um, Magma correctly just identifies what it is, right? And these kind of things you would never find in an ImageNet, like an ImageNet dataset would not contain the class label Apple with an uh, sign on it that says iPod, right? And uh, that's the beauty of it. Okay, so um, let's talk about how the method works. 
Uh, as I said, the backbone of MAGMA is a large uh, autoregressive language model um, for the uh, publicly available version, or also the, the paper publication, we use the openly available uh, GPTJ uh, model by Eleuther. Um, you might be familiar with it. That's about uh, six billion parameters in size, so not tiny, but also not very huge. And then, of course, for the multimodal models uh, employed um, on our uh, API, we, of course, use the in-house luminous models. So uh, how does it work? Um, the basic idea is very simple. So we know how transformer works. And um, apart from the very first word embedding stage, all that a transformer does is it parses hidden states right from every layer to layer. It's just a bunch of vectors. So if you kind of skip that word embedding stage, you can, if you want, input any sequence of vectors to a transformer. It will be able to parse it. Of course, natively, if you input some random stuff, then you will get some garbage output. So, um, but we kind of um, thought about the intuition, what Jonas already mentioned, that a transformer has kind of a hidden world representation, right? So also across languages, uh, where um, we're building on the intuition that a transformer has its own internal language. And we thought that it should be possible to also translate images into these into this internal language. And this is what we uh, tried. So if you look at the, um, I'd like to have a pointer, but I think I don't have a pointer, so I'm just going to explain it like that. So if, you, if we start in the upper left, uh, we start with an image. And what we first do is we uh, apply an image encoder. And here we used actually the visual part of Clip, because uh, Clip is kind of trained to already to extract some semantic information about the image. Um, and so the clip visual encoder produces a feature grid. Uh, here in the, in the schematic, it's just the image cut up. But in reality, of course, it will be some abstract uh, feature representation of the image. And then all we need to do is flatten that image because the transformer, uh, flatten that grid, I mean, uh, because the transformer expects a sequence, right? And then maybe also the dimensionality of the features is not correct yet. So all we do here is apply a simple linear uh, transformation, nothing too fancy. Uh, we actually also tried using um, a bit more sophisticated uh, prefix layers such as uh, transformer encoders or MLP, but we found that um, a linear layer really just worked best, which again reinforces the notion that so the, the clip visual encoder already extracts uh, semantically meaningful um, features that kind of just needs to be very simply translated into the dimensionality of the transformer. So this is the, the left part where the image comes in. And that would already uh, work fine on its own. Um, the frozen model has kind of already demonstrated that in a way. And then we thought, OK, so now we translate images um, into the transformer space. But we still might be the, the, uh, a little bit out of distribution for the layers. And for that, we introduced these adapter components in between the transformer blocks. Uh, so this is also already a kind of an established technique in the NLP community for parameter efficient fine tuning. And we thought this might just work out here as well, because uh, as I said, OK, we deal with images, not natural language. But we just translated the language kind of, uh, sorry, the images into language space. So this might be uh, a good idea. And um, yeah, so the training procedure of this whole thing is then that so all the blue components you see here, all the transformer components are frozen, and all the red components are trained. Um, for the image encoder clip, so we start from the pre-trained clip checkpoint, and we just slightly tune this. You could also leave that frozen. That would also work well. But we found that fine-tuning that uh, together end-to-end -to -end improved performance a little bit. And the um, training objective is just the same as for vanilla uh, transformer training. It's just the next token uh, cross-entropy <laughs> prediction. And the big advantage of doing it that way is that the language model remains completely intact. And its uh, world knowledge and all the in-context and few-shot abilities uh, get preserved. And also from the deployment side of things, um, uh, it's very efficient because uh, we, don't, we, ha we don't have an additional multimodal model that we kind of need to spin up. But we can just switch on or off the adaptive kind of on the go. So uh, our engineers are also happy about that. OK. Um, yeah, maybe uh, next, I, I just want to briefly uh, go a little bit into more detail about the adapters. So as you can already see here, uh, an adapter is just a 
bottleneck MLP with one down projection, a nonlinearity, and an up projection. And uh, yeah, you have a little bit of choices on where you exactly place them. Um, there's actually a whole zoo of adapters. These three are actually not all. There are a lot of different ways. Uh, we just tried these three. So um, the first one would be uh, using the adapter sequentially. So uh, the PLM module here stands for pre-trained uh, language model module. This would be either the attention or the feed forward block of the transformer layer. And um, we can add the adapter sequentially, meaning that the output of the layer just gets fed into the adapter and added in a residual fashion. Um, and the parallel adapter would be just taking the input to the layer and adding this. And another little twist on that would be to um, introduce a kind of learnable scaling parameter, which you see on the right. I'm not gonna dwell on this too long. We did uh, some ablations on that and uh, found out that the sequential version worked best for our setting. So uh, just a little bit uh, technical um, interlude here. Okay, um, also some more details. So our final training set, uh, we used uh, kind of a hand-picked combination of data sets. Um, there are some more generic data sets in it, like uh, a subset of uh, Lion, uh, Wikipedia image text, uh, CC3M, and then we also used actually a little bit uh, task-specific data set as well, uh, visual genome, and actually also um, some downstream training uh, splits um, to directly boost its downstream uh, performance already during pre-training. And we trained uh, the model for around, uh, for the publication, the publicly available one for um, 7.6 million image text pairs. Okay, I uh, quickly want to mention uh, yeah, some of the downstream tasks that you uh, might want to use Magma for and what, we, what you can also evaluate because there are some nice data sets for it. Uh, I guess the, uh, one of the prime candidates is, would be visual question answering. And um, the example you see here would be such a case uh, and also the example of a two-shot prompt. So I guess most of you are probably aware with the concept but uh, what a uh, few shot prompting is, is that as you can see, we give the model two um, examples. So uh, this um, outside knowledge visual question answering here, and we give it two already answered examples, and then the model is supposed to answer the third one. And we found that especially um, in outside knowledge VQA, outside knowledge meaning that the answer to the question cannot simply be only inferred from the visual information like in the example, so you cannot um, the, uh, get the answer from the visual, but you need to know uh, the concept of a sheep and what sound they make, right? And this is exactly where the frozen language model then shines, and we found that uh, especially OKVQA works pretty strong, and at the time of publication, uh, we would even achieve a state of the art in that benchmark with Magma. Um, yeah, another use case is, of course, image captioning, uh, right? And for image captioning, we found that uh, it works the best really with a natural language prompt. Um, so something like a picture of works pretty well, but I also have some other examples later on where you see what I mean. Uh, okay, and then also something that I would like to mention, so uh, some of you might be aware that DeepMind also recently released a, a very nice um, multimodal model called uh, Flamingo. Uh, they also cite our work, and Flamingo works also a bit similar to Magma. Here the backbone is also a uh, frozen language model, uh, in that case it's Chinchilla. And here the major difference is that uh, Flamingo does not use this image prefix to translate the images into transformer space, but rather cross attention. So it's a little bit more sophisticated, and it's a very uh, impressive model for sure. Um, yeah, and this is uh, actually a, a probably very cherry-picked example from uh, their own paper. So yeah, we couldn't resist and you know try the comparison between uh, Flamingo and our model. And uh, yeah, I think we we fare up quite well against this. Uh, so it's in this very cherry-picked example. But uh, yeah, so this is the, the monster soup. Uh, yeah, one of my my favorites for sure. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, towards the end, I also just want to show you uh, some funny examples, which I'm sure you all have been waiting for. And there you can also nicely see uh, some yeah, more uh, natural language uh, instructions that, uh, from which you can produce some really nice outputs. I'm just going to let it sit here for, uh, <laughs> for a few uh, seconds. So my personal favorite is uh, the middle one, I have to say. So I like this image because it shows that even the most dangerous animals can be saddened by something like a birthday. I think it has some really uh, profound uh, meaning uh, 
and it uh, touches me uh, deeply. I, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then some more on the next one. Uh, yeah, you can also prompt it with OMG, look at this image, a wood slice with a cute face on it, and it, it sure is a wood face with a cute uh, face. I think Robert's favorite is the one on the right. Uh, it has definitely some, <laughs> some British humor to it, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I can only in, invite you to, also if you have the opportunity, play around with it. So. Um, the, the GPTJ Markmar is uh, publicly available. Uh, available. The weights um, you can download on, on, on the GitHub. Uh, you need somewhat of a capable GPU to run it. Uh, nothing super fancy, but it won't run on a laptop, unfortunately. But maybe you have the opportunity, and I can only invite you to play around with it. It's a lot of fun. Or, of course, you can buy some of our credits, which would be even better. <laughs> and you, can, uh, you can also, if you register, you get some free credits, right? <laughs> so it, that's enough for playing up with some images. Exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is our, our luminous magma. Um, and uh, yeah, then uh, lastly, I want to quickly also talk about um, uh, an interesting uh, development, uh, which would be a luminous explore. So um, this is a method uh, we discovered uh, in how, how we can make use of the internal uh, embeddings for a semantic search application. I'm just going to uh, yeah, go quickly go over that one. Um, maybe first explain a little bit what semantic search is. So uh, the use case here would be that um, I have a, qu a natural language query. This could be a short sentence or maybe also a document. And then I have a large corpus of uh, documents from which I usually would like to retrieve um, documents which are in some way um, have uh, uh, a high semantic similarity to the, to the query. And uh, this is not, uh, not so uniquely defined, I would say. You can certainly uh, also give long philosophical talks about what semantic similarity is, but in a very practical, uh, from a very practical perspective, um, if you have, for example, a, a question and you would receive from a set of answers, then that could mean that the answer is not exactly like the question, but uh, yeah, it, it, it can definitely depend on the use case, what, uh, what, what that means. But, um, I, I, I guess a common use case would be something like if I have a document and I want to find a document which uh, maybe a very sci scientific article and I'm interested to um, hearing more about that field and then I want to retrieve from my database many documents which have similar content. So that would be, I guess, one of the easiest examples. Uh, yeah, just coming down to the technical, we uh, just uh, differentiate between two types of semantic search. A symmetric search uh, where the query and the um, the potential semantic neighbor have uh, overall, let's say, the same structure uh, and the length also, and the asymmetric search um, where the query is usually much shorter than uh, the document. So in, in both cases, uh, the way I would retrieve this is uh, that I use some kind of um, embedding model. For symmetric search, I only need one, and for asymmetric search, I need one embedding model for the query and for the document separately because they have usually yeah, different structures, so I would need two, two different models to parse them. And then once I have uh, uh, embedded my, my whole corpus, I can just, uh, for each query, um, run, uh, like calculate the scores against the whole corpus um, through a cosine similarity, then I get some scores, and then I can uh, retrieve the top K documents, and this is uh, how my search works. And uh, classically, um, you would use, uh, for, for these embedding models, you would usually use uh, encoder models. They, they always kind of uh, excelled at this. Um, so the way you, that would work is that you would take your favorite bird-like uh, model, right, and you would kind of fine tune it. Uh, the way you would obtain the semantic representation vector is usually through a mean pooling uh, operation, and uh, yeah, this is rather standard. But we were wondering, okay, we have these huge and very performant decoder models lying around. Can you actually also use a decoder model for a semantic search? Um, and this is what uh, a master student uh, investigated, uh, Niklas Munikov. He did a uh, research uh, internship at Aleph Alpha and uh, came up with a method called uh, dubbed SGPT. And this is a method to turn decoder models into um, uh, semantic embedding models. Uh, got, just going to quickly go over it here as well. So the, the paradigm is kind of similar as to MAGMA. The, um, the backbone of it is a pre-trained decoder model that we also almost freeze. So here the only thing we um, fine-tune would be the biases. This is a method called bitfit. And similar to adapters, it's uh, 
a very parameter efficient fine tuning method coming from the NLP community. And then similar as you would for an encoder model, we apply uh, a weighted mean pooling operation. And optionally, we might also apply a, a down projection layer. The um, background here being that, of course, our decoder models are very large, like the hidden dimensions, like from luminous base, they start at 5,120, and then it goes even larger. And this is uh, yeah, not very uh, efficient, uh, let's say. Um, you can easily imagine that may maybe for semantic similarity, I don't need the full 5,120 dimensions. So you might uh, want to downscale this a little bit. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, just to go into a little bit uh, into the detail, especially about the weighted mean pooling, because I think it's kind of interesting, um, is, uh, yeah, that's the, the method that we came up with. So for, for encoders, you usually just do a mean pooling over all the uh, hidden states which makes sense because in, in an encoder, um, all the hidden states are kind of treated equally, right? But in a decoder, you have this information flow. Um, so usually the, the, uh, the, the uh, later hidden states carry more information. So uh, we also run ablations there a little bit, trying, for example, only the last token embedding that's also commonly used for classification with these decoder models. But we actually found that using this weighted mean pooling, which just linearly weights, uh, the uh, hidden states and the, the latest one gets, gets the highest weight. That works really well. And we also found that if we, we can actually do a drastic compression from the hidden size from 5,120 to 128. And this only results in minimal performance degra degradation uh, across five benchmarks. And um, your computing cosines with these smaller vectors, it's much faster. And also for storing a corpora, it uh, also takes up much less space. Um, yeah, and talking of uh, benchmarks, also here we uh, have some really positive results with our um, luminous base SGPT embedding model. So in symmetrics, uh, this we benchmarked against OpenAI semantic similarity endpoint, which is also commercially available. And um, uh, yeah, for symmetric search, you can see that we are here uh, top of the class, and also for asymmetric one, um, we're very competitive. So um, yeah, with that being said, I'm at the end of my presentation. Just to go back again, um, this method was developed in a research internship. And if you're interested in doing so as well, then maybe my colleague would have some good news for you. And with <laughs> that, I hand over. Thank you, Constantine. <laughs> yeah, so my, my name is Robert. I'm a senior researcher at Aleph Alpha, and I'm going to tell you now about some of the current things that we're doing. So you've just seen some recent results. I'm going to tell you a bit about what we're doing at the moment to give you an insight into the kind of projects we're doing. I'm going to talk a bit about what it's like to work at Aleph Alpha, what, how it feels to be there. And then I'm going to talk also about some opportunities there are. So, um, one of the topics that's very keen to my heart that we're working on is the following. So Jonas talked a little bit at the beginning about the, the, what we believe is the coming industrial revolution that will be driven in large part by greater and greater use of AI. At the moment, already, AI systems are affecting many aspects of our lives and being deployed kind of on us by large corporations. But as things progress, they're going to be deployed by smaller players. They're going to be used by smaller organizations in different ways to achieve different aims by different people. We're trying to make AI systems that will be usable in various different situations by various different people from different cultures with different cultural backgrounds and different ways of thinking, different ways of talking. We want to make models that are appropriate to the peoples, the diverse peoples of Europe. And so we're, we're trying to make our systems safe, but we don't want to create a monolithic ethics that will force people in the south of Spain to enjoy only the humor that we find fit in Heidelberg. So we want to make systems that are controllable, that can be steered in different ways using natural language. I mean, another way to say that is we want to make them more useful. We want to make the, the prompt engineering easier. This is one of the, one of the topics that we're working on and uh, something that I care very much about. We also want to make these systems deployable in many different situations. We want different organizations to be able to use them. That means we don't want to make systems that can only be deployed if you have access to absolutely massive supercompute. 
So one of the sort of encouraging but also bitter lessons of, of the previous years is that there are these scaling laws. And what this essentially means is that the most performant, most advanced AI systems that we're going to be able to produce are going to require huge amounts of compute to deliver them as well as to train them. So we're working very hard to challenge that, to come up with new ways of doing deep learning that have different scaling laws. A couple of examples, we're working on, um, we've got a, a major project on retrievals. This is where you have an external store of knowledge and information so that the system, the AI system, can focus on processing and reasoning and leave the sort of retaining of, of knowledge to some external body. That's one way. Another way is that we're, we're, we're very fortunate to be one of the early uh, partners of an organization called GraphCore in the UK. So GraphCore produce a competitor to NVIDIA's GPUs and to the TPU, obviously, from Google. And what's really exciting about the, the IPU, as they call it, is that it, it's it's, a, it's able to operate, it's a, able to execute nearly arbitrary compute on parallel cores at the same time. So it's almost like a cluster of CPUs in the sense that it can natively represent non-dense matrix multiplications without having to represent the zeros, say, or it can, it can carry out logic separately on the different cores, for example. So you can imagine programs that execute loops with trained parameters and all kinds of kind of logical structures. So, this is a very exciting direction, and uh, just to give you a taste of some of the things we're thinking about now and in the future. Of course, we have other research topics. You've seen, um, you've seen something on multimodal. We've seen magma. We also have a continuing effort in this direction. We're in the early stages of thinking about image generation. We continue to work on semantic search, including in a multimodal setting. We're working on neurosymbolic. We're trying to create a, a layer between the natural language of the world and the software that individuals and companies use. Those softwares generally have APIs. They take kind of logical inputs. And yet, they, if they're going to operate on information from the, from the world, we're going to need to be able to convert natural text into the formats of APIs. So we're working on this. Um, so a kind of neuro-symbolic interface between natural text and symbolic programs. We're working on interpretability because as these systems are deployed by more people and more organizations in more places that affect us all, it's really important that we, as people affected by these things, and also for the people deploying them, that they are at least on a high level interpretable how they're fu functioning. So we're working on this. We, obviously, safety is very important to us. And yeah, finally, we're working on challenging the hardware lottery. So the hardware lottery is the idea for, I'm sure you all know this, but the hardware lottery is the idea that the form of the AI systems we have today, the algorithms we can create is strongly influenced by the hardware we've got on which to run them. And so by using radically different types of hardware, then we hope to be able to create radically different types of software and different kinds of systems also. So these are some of the topics we are thinking about. What's it like to be at Aleph Alpha? So um, at Aleph Alpha, we are very collaborative. It is not like working in a university. You have different incentives. In a university, kind of nearly everybody needs to kind of be a star in their own right and, have, and own their own project somehow. It's important to have a whole load of first public author publications and your PhD, so on and so forth. One of the nice things about working in industry is that you can be a part of something bigger than you could possibly have done yourself. These projects we're working on require a lot of people to collaborate together. So if you came to work at Aleph Alpha, you would, people would want you to work with them, and they would want to be a part of what you're doing. And it's intensely collaborative. It's very kind of social as part of what we do. We, we program in pairs a lot of the time. We don't, we don't work in isolation. So that's, that's a big part of it. Also, we, what's exciting about what we do is that there, we, we really believe and see, the, and are already seeing, that these systems can have a real world impact in the real world. So we're doing, we're, we re, we're researching basic AI technologies, but these AI technologies are chosen so that we think they will have the maximum positive impact 
in the real world in deployment, in productization. And so this is also exciting. We were looking for people to join us who have extremely strong research skills, who have extremely strong coding skills, and who want to create things that will change the world. So I'm happy to announce we've got an internship program which has just been set up, um, and it's for PhD students. So people sort of in their second year of PhD and, and later, for example. And there are also full-time positions. Um, You've seen already the semantic search model. That was, an in, uh, that was a research internship from a, a research intern. So really cool things can happen in this time. And you'll have a lot of support and really skilled colleagues and a lot of compute and a lot of investment from the people around you to support you what you're doing. So it's a really exciting opportunity, I think. For full-time positions, um, we're always looking for great people. These are just a couple of openings currently on the website right now in research, but we're looking also for people in engineering. We're looking for, if you've got friends or you, know, or you are interested in marketing, we're looking in marketing communications, we're hiring in, in um, human resources. We have a, a, a thirst for good people. Um, but I'm talking to you today about research. That's the org I'm part of, and we have a new internship program, which is really exciting. It'll be for about four to six months, up, you know, through discussion with you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, thanks to Jonas and Constantine for doing the hard work and presenting lots of nice things. And thanks for the opportunity to just uh, show you this. Thanks. <laughs>